your process systems all sit on. They sit on the people. If you're not taking care of the people, developing your people, uh, caring for your people, then those, those other systems are going to have problems themselves. And I think we lose sight of that. I really believe that the best leaders, the real ideal of, of leadership is being able to balance both driving results, but at the same time, caring and engaging your people. Hello there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of your Orthopreneurs Podcast. I've got somebody who's an author, he's a researcher, he's a keynote speaker, and he's a coach, so a performance coach. And so please welcome Dr. Jason Jones. How are you, Jason? I'm great, Glenn. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, he's a real doctor. He, he has a PhD. And uh, for many of us who did research out there, uh, we got masters, very few of us have PhDs, but I'm just telling you, man, um, I feel your pain because it's never <laughs> easy going through those programs and I respect the heck out of you for it. Jason, uh, among many other things I just told you about him, uh, is going to be speaking at the Orthopreneur Summit at Sea. Uh, he's somebody I'm really excited about having on the cruise. And, and we've had a chance to actually sit in person because he's located here in Dallas and actually talk in a way that I don't get to with many of the keynote speakers we have at most meetings. And I'm telling you all out there right now, you're in for a huge treat because the average person listening right now is generally an orthodontist or somebody associated with the orthodontic world, tend to be higher achievers, tend to be really smart folks, uh, tend to have gotten to where they got to based on sheer will, uh, intellect, drive. For many of us, we hit a certain point in our life where the performance kind of peaks a little bit. And I'd say it's it's not the rule, it's more of an exception of people who have coaches in our industry that they work with. And so that's something I want to dive into you with a little bit. But before we get there, I'll let you start with this. Tell me a little bit about your background. How did you kind of end up where you are now? I think that's a great place to start. Well, I won't go too far back, but let me just go back to uh, graduate school. And I thought I wanted to be a counseling psychologist and uh, went and started working on a master's degree in that. And I got into that about a year and a half into it when I had to have uh, court appointed uh, clients uh, that I was working with and realizing this is not what I want to do. <laughs> and uh, I began to kind of look more at what areas of psychology and you know, being your best, what area um, do I really want to be in where it really fills me up and allows me to give my best to others? Because counseling psychology wasn't doing it. And uh, it was draining me too much. And I, um, I, I essentially found the area of industrial organizational psychology. Luckily, I found, found that before I went and got a PhD in counseling psychology. And uh, <laughs> I found the world of organizational performance and, or, and organizational behavior and uh, really fell in love with the idea of better understanding motivation, uh, engagement, and performance in the workplace. And so uh, after my master's, I went uh, and pursued a PhD in that area and then got involved. Uh, I knew I needed to get uh, real world experience. Uh, not only did I run a company at that time, but then a small business, a computer training business, uh, I, I started working in the corporate world and uh, as a consultant and then sold my business and then went in full time into uh, my corporate role and did that for uh, the next 15 years, essentially. And in that role, I got to work and really kind of cut my teeth in not only leading, leading teams and, uh, you know, uh, helping uh, different organizations and, and pieces of organizations to position their people to be their best, to help leaders to, to uh, lead better so that it brings out the best in their people. And so within all this kind of process of doing that, it allowed me to get a practical perspective of what really works and not just what the research is, right? And then also what works from a behavioral perspective as well as a neuroscience perspective. So after getting a PhD in 2003, Fast forward about five years and I am starting to study the neuroscience and I'm realizing, well, wait a second, there's a whole nother world here of application that some of it is even um, antithetical in many ways to what behavioral uh, studies and uh, what behavioral psychology was telling us at, at, at the time. And so that's where I really leaned into that area and began to implement that. Uh, and that's what I've done over the last uh, 15 years or so. 
uh, from a corporate perspective and then moved into my own business about five years ago, uh, where now I do this uh, around the country with uh, different organizations and work with a select group of executive leaders each uh, each year. For those of you out there who want just a concise sort of summary, if I understand it properly, I refer to you as an organizational psychologist who specializes in working with leaders, right, for better performance. Is that the best way to put it? Yeah. And, we, you know, there's a lot to be said in there. There's a lot of words out there related to motivation and engagement and, you know, all those different things around leadership. Right. But what we're all trying to get is how do we unleash people to be and do their best? And if you're doing this the right way, I think it's about being helping people be and do their best in work and life. And that's really what excites me about it. It's what really drives me in the work that I do. And that's what excites me uh, for so many reasons, having spent time with you, for the people listening right now. You know, we always say, come to our meeting. We've got the best speakers. We've got this. We've got that. This year, I decided no orthodontist on the entire speaking gig. There might be one here or there that's going to come in at the last minute that we'll talk about for something clinical. But I wanted to bring in people that no orthodontist has probably ever heard of. People who are exceptional in their field, who are going to give a fresh perspective on how to live your, right? My tagline at Orthopreneurs is helping orthodontists lead their most profitable, best, lowest stress lives, period, right? It, I didn't say become the best clinicians. There's many ways people can become good at that. What I want is I want them right now, there's almost an existential crisis in orthodontics for team members, right? Orthodontists, and you know this already from our conversations, but most do not, that orthodontists are in a very, very special position in that we are the CEO, we're the chief marketing officer, we're the chief of everything, and yet we work with the line worker side by side with them at the chair every single day. And what that means is, A, there's a big discrepancy in the way we were trained versus the way many of our team members were trained educationally. And B, we were not trained in helping people bring out their best. I mean, let alone our best. So what you find is a lot of dysfunction, right? A lot of, a lot of conjecture where people say, this is the best way to take care of a team. This is the best way to train. And we know there is no best way, right? There's best way for certain situations. But at the end of the day, I'm so thrilled to have you speaking at the meeting because you're going to be speaking to the doctors and the team at the same time. The title, I got to read this because I want to make sure I get this right, is Evolve and Thrive, Building a Mindset to Win in Any Situation. Right, And that's exactly what I wanted. And, and, and you're phenomenal. And I've got another five to seven speakers similar to you who are going to touch on different areas at Summit to try to build people, their, their, to make them bulletproof, if you will. And best of all, give them a glimpse into other areas of the world that they may not know about so that if someone said, hey, you know what? I really like this Jason Jones. I'm going to call him and I'm going to work with him after this is done, right? Because they really want to do that. And so let's jump into a couple of things here because you've worked with a fair number of leaders. What are some commonalities you find when, when you work with a leader? And by definition, a leader is somebody who's leading right? They're, they're already winning the game, if you will. What are some of the most common things that you see that people need to work on when they come to you for help and leadership training and performance? Well, you know, uh, leaders are really good at focusing on the outcome, focusing on the goal. In fact, that's what got them to where they are. Typically, is because they've been very good at creating a vision and and setting goals and then pursuing those goals relentlessly. And, um, and that's what has made them very successful. What I see a lot of leaders miss out on, especially as leaders rise in an organization or as leaders be, get a practice that is uh, becomes busier and busier, is that they keep that focus on the goal and the outcome, which is great, you know, profitability and efficiency and, and those sorts of things. But one thing that, that I see often is that they lose sight of the process, how they're getting there. And if, we, if we're not careful, any of us in any type of situation, if we don't take time to think about and take care of the process, 
we can sabotage ourselves. And then we wonder okay. why are we having problems getting to that outcome? Or I've gotten to the outcome and now it's slipping. I'm working with a practice right now in North Carolina. It's not an orthodontist practice, it's another medical practice. And they've got a group of doctors and uh, that work and they work very diligently at multiple locations. And they've been very successful, but now they're seeing a number of problems with retention, turnover, with uh, uh, waste. And then with essentially kind of just having some disgruntled employees that, you know, they've gone beyond the honeymoon of their the honeymoon stage. And now they feel like they want to give more, have more ownership of what they do. And they they want to feel that sense of self-direction in the work. And when they're not getting it, they're they're then rebelling and the the uh, the business suffers. And so those who run the practice are wondering why why is it not going the way it was? What's happening? And they've lost sight of the process which in the process is how we lead and how we help support, unleash our people so they can run our business and we can be and reach those outcomes that we want to reach. So I would say that's the first and foremost thing is that. And there's a lot underneath that we could talk about, but that that's from a high high line standpoint, that's the big one. And, and, and that's a great one because I want to I want to jump into that one for just a second with just a little anecdote. So back when I was a general dentist uh, working in Seattle, um, had a great practice, loved it. I've, I've talked a lot about it over the years. And I, I was trained specifically from a guy named uh, Michael Schuster at the Schuster Center, uh, phenomenal systems-based training, right? I brought my whole team. And for anybody out there who doesn't want to invest in their future or on themselves, I spent $57,000, $57,000 in the year 2000. 57,000, not including travel costs for my entire team three times from Seattle to Arizona to go to the Schuster Center. And it, it was the best money I ever spent in my life. Um, great education on yourself and your team and great training is the best investment you'll ever make. And we went three, we went four times, but I went without them once and they came with me three times. And it was all about policies and systems, 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 systems. How do we run and how to effectively create policies and systems? And I had one team member, and it, because you mentioned something I wanted to dive into. I had one team member who repeatedly fought me every time I'd bring a new policy and system to the meeting. And um, why do we have to do this? This is silly. We don't, whatever. And ultimately, she would acquiesce and we would do what we had to do. When I sold the practice in 2011, and went back to ortho residency in 12. I got an email from her shortly after I left. And she you could tell through the email she was almost in tears. And she said, I missed the policies and systems once you left. Right? I'm thinking of leaving the practice. And so a lot of doctors are very worried and concerned if I'm too rigid, if I come up with too many standardized ways of doing things, if I if my systems are not are too rigid or too in place. They're not going to like it. And I'm here to tell you folks, I don't care who's working with you. It's the exact opposite. If people don't feel guidance and direction and it's willy nilly, the mob is happy for a little while. And then they start wondering why they're doing what they're doing and how they're doing what they're doing. And they get frustrated. And, and like you said, they leave. It's a toxic work environment. And so you're preaching to the choir, brother. I think, um, I think what you're saying is dead on. And, and systems are important, but even more important is how you implement and how you manage those systems. Because some systems are technological, right? Some systems are processes, but also a part of that system is people. How you manage your people, how you interact with people, how you manage when things don't go right or there's a mistake that happens. Those are big when it comes to uh, the managing the process. Because it's within those types of situations that really tell people whether they're valued. Um, it really helps you know, are they learning and growing? And those things together, are what you know, it, it, it forms the foundation that your uh, technology, if your, your process systems all sit on. They sit on the people. And if the people, if you're not taking care of the people, developing your people, uh, caring for your people, then those uh, those other systems are going to have problems themselves. And I think we lose sight of that. I really believe that the best leaders, um, the real ideal of, of leadership is being able to balance 
both driving results, but at the same time, caring and engaging your people, helping them feel that sense of ownership, uh, ownership of their work and, and uh, engagement in what they do. And when you can bring both of those things together and it build that balance there, then that can really enhance your ability to, to get the outcomes you want, but get them not just for the short term, but for the long term, which Glenn, this is one of the reasons why I, uh, I tempered my behavioral perspective in organizational behavior and, and leadership. A lot of the behaviorism parts of leadership uh, that I learned in graduate school, and you learn from the psychology of leadership or the psychology of humans and motivation, is uh, move away from threat, although we still use it a lot, and move towards reward. And, and that's move towards, that, that move towards reward, reward people, reward. appreciate people, tell them. Now, there's there is some goodness in that. We do want to appreciate people and we want to reward. But the problem is, is that too many leaders think that reward is what actually gets people to the point where they want to give their best and do their best and develop right. their best. They think that's what lights up the brain, which I call this idea of lighting up the brain activation, which is what my book is about. And leaders through experiences and, and through interactions, they can literally light up the brain. The research shows this. And I can talk a little bit about this if you want to. But the, the, idea, the idea, though, is that we've the brain science has showed us that if we are just we're using reward and threat. We're using the two most fundamental parts of the brain and not the most powerful part of the brain. Because you see, if we use threat, we're using the brain stem, the cerebellum, the inner brain. We know that as the, the lizard brain. It's, it's the same part of a brain that uh, almost every other uh, walking, crawling animal has. Okay, That's why they move away uh, from things uh, that, that would, could kill them. That's how they stay alive. And so it's all about threat and staying alive and self-protection, okay? Threats yeah. and, and telling people you're going to fire them and yelling at people, you're using the most basic and primitive part of the brain. We know that that works very short-term. And because we have a cerebral cortex, we know that that doesn't last long-term. People will rebel against it. And in this day and age, they'll go somewhere else. They'll want to work somewhere else, okay? They at the very us. least, if they stay there, they're going to not be giving their best because their brain's not at their best. That leads to the question, and I, I don't want to get to the spoiler alert, but heck, why not? What does motivate people? Let me hit the second part of that, then, since you asked this question, and that is, well, what about reward? Well, reward, we know, is really the reward system. Our brain is our midbrain, and it's in the more of the center, central part of our brain called the mammalian brain. And so why? Because many mammals have that. This is why those creatures, those animals that have this part of the brain, you can train them. And how do you train any dog or, you know, elephant or whatever? How do you train them? You do it through reward. You get them to do a behavior, then you reward it. That works very well with animals. And here's the reason why is because they don't have a developed prefrontal cortex like we do. That's the executive function of our brain. Uh, some of them do have cerebral cortexes, but they're not developing. They don't have a prefrontal cortex like we do that allows us to think about our own thinking. It allows us to metacogitate. I'll throw that word out there for you. Uh, and that's metacogitate. Just, metacognition is the is the uh, scientific word. I think I saw that in Minority Report with Tom yeah. Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really thinking about our own thinking. We're, we're the only being on earth that we know that can think about our own thinking. So we can play chess. So we can uh, uh, control our own brain uh, and, and utilize what we have, this mind, this conscience, uh, consciousness that we have. And so here's the thing with threat, with uh, reward, those are the two main things that are used to motivate people, is that it's not using the best of someone's brain. You're using the two areas that are the least powerful, and it does not... Uh, account for the fact that we are humans. And when we're rewarded with something, we it's it's good at first, but it's short lived, right? We satiate, term called satiation. And what that means is it's good for a little bit, but then it's not good for us anymore. We want more, right? right? So what we've seen in the, the, the literature 
And we also know from brain science is when we only use reward and think that's how we're going to lead and, and motivate and engage people and improve performance, if we're only using reward, a standard, and then reward for how someone behaves, it doesn't last long. And you having to constantly hold your hand and, and, and you're not using the best of someone's brain. We satiate from that. And we often have a term that we, that we use a lot these days that explains this phenomenon of rewarding and expecting better and better behavior and not getting it. And that term is called entitlement. So when you reward, our brain moves into a mindset of entitlement when we are reward over and over again. And then it becomes an expectation. And if it is removed, we become quickly angered and disgruntled. In fact, a lot of times, and you'll see in the research, you can, um, at the very beginning, you can reward someone for doing something. And then over time, what you'll see is they will not improve or not keep doing. Uh, they won't keep their, their improvements up, but they still expect the reward. And even if they get a reward, they won't continue to improve because they become entitled to that reward at that level of behavior. So you ask what then, what, where do we go with this? And really it is uh, rooted in our prefrontal cortex. And that is helping people connect what is intrinsically rewarding to them and has intrinsic value to them with the work that they're doing. Okay. So there's got to be that connection there. Is it money and reward? There could be a little bit of that in there. That's okay. We all want to make money for working. And it can be helpful and somewhat motivational to be able to make more money up to a certain point for working harder or learning new things, implementing new ways of doing it. But it's typically short-lived and not near as powerful and does not help us with our resilience and our ability to change and to be more determined like whenever we know that this is something that we identify with, that we uh, have an intrinsic deep value for what we're doing. So this is why when I'm working with uh, you know, practice leaders or business leaders, it's important to help them understand how do you help people understand what is, uh, for the, even for themselves, what is intrinsically valuing to them? And then how do we connect that to their work so they get that more intrinsic motivation that then is self-directed and you're not having to constantly reward. They want to do it out of their, their own volition. That's something that I think every business owner would love to have, right? The idea that every one of their team members is self-motivated to go do the best work in a way that perpetuates. You know, the conversations we have online so much, and I talk about it, uh, is... You know, you'll see one guy says, oh, I take my team out to lunch all the time. They love me. Or I got them Kendra Scott necklaces for Christmas. And I, I'm not knocking those. I'm not saying that those are bad ideas. And I, I even present when I lecture and when I speak on the concept of having to speak the love language of each individual person, right? Somebody who's into acts of service, giving them a, a necklace is nice, but that doesn't, doesn't make them as happy as saying, hey, you know what? Great work today. Let me clean up those instruments for you right? You're speaking their love language. But what you're talking about is an even deeper level. It's, it, it transcends just simple, here's something or look what I did for you. It's, it's, it's allowing them to really build on something and become better at what they do, right? That, that's right. And, and, and it's about them. What, what, are, what, are they, what is being anchored in them about their work that they, it gets them up in the morning and they don't loathe coming to work. It makes them say, I want to give my best, not ju get, just give enough to get to not get fired. Right. And how many people do right. that? Right. They're just I want to give just enough to not get fi fired, to give them this mindset and the idea of, hey, if I do my best on this, I am actually benefiting something. And it makes me feel better inside when I give my extra effort for this. Right. And, and that's what we want to help people connect with. And that's essentially what I do and help leaders with. And if you want to, uh, you know, shameless plug here, if you want to learn how to do this and go really in depth in it, then read my book, Activator, because that's essentially what the whole book is this about. Book? Yeah, that book right there. It is this a book. You mean this book? That, the that, Activator that book, book using brain science to boost motivation, deepen engagement, and supercharge performance. That Those book. who are not listening, who are watching, can see me holding this up. But it's called Activator, 
by Jason Jones, PhD, and you can buy, I have no financial interest in it, but you can buy it paperback or listen to it in Audible, right? Sorry, I had to do a pitch for you there, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Paperback, hardback, Audible. Uh, You can get it at Barnes and Noble. You can get it at uh, uh, Amazon, Books a Million. Uh, But, you know, the idea here is, is that as a leader, you are uniquely positioned, unlike anyone else, likely in the world (laughs) for these people. If you're a manager, if you're a leader, uh, you're working with someone, interacting with them a day, a, every day, you are in a position that a unique position that can allow that, that where if you harness that, if you leverage that, you can light the brain up of people in a way that will help bring out their best, help them become more motivated, help them to give their best in their job, help them to be more happy in life. And then they take this stuff and they take it home and they're better in every part of their life uh, as, as a parent, as a as a spouse or partner or as a community leader, leader or as a PTA volunteer or as a church volunteer, or synagogue, vol- whatever it might, they're bringing it to the world and they're teaching these things. In fact, when I'm there with you all, I'm going to be teaching six specific strategies, Glenn, that your, your, your folks here there that, we, that we'll be there with uh, on the boat with. That's going to be lots of fun. I'm looking forward to that. Um, I, I've I, got to I, tell you right now, Jason, I'm so excited by you giving this topic to doctors and their teams at the same time. Um, again, I've, I've been a vocal, outspoken uh, proponent of the fact that to bring a team member to this meeting, you can put two team members in an inside room for $1,600, including the ticket of admission. That's $800 per team member plus airfare, but all the food is taken care of at that point. Why people are not bringing their entire team, I don't understand. There are many practices. I have, we have one practice being 25 people, 25 people. So everybody out there, this is a meeting with Dr. Jason Jones and a whole bunch of other people just like him. So please go to opsummit2024.com and sign up. Sorry again, Jason. I just want to give people an opportunity to understand where <laughs> good, to go. Good plug. I like that. Good, good plug. I, have to, I mean, <laughs> let's be honest. If you, speak, you like speaking to more people rather than less people. Absolutely. And and you, we're going to have not only we're going to learn and we're going to enjoy it. It's going to be a huge pool of knowledge we're all going to be giving to and taking away from. And at the same time, having loads of fun while we're doing it. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, I, I know that anyone who brings their team, their team, it's going to be this will be a memory you make. And you are going to you're going to engender loyalty like you've never before. When you do things like this, and I mean, I've known and seen many leaders who are investing their people like this. Um, and, and it really isn't that big of an investment when you look at, when you lose one person, the cost that it, 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 it incurs just to replace one person in terms of getting someone in at that level and getting them up to speed and all that, right? And so this is, a, I think it's a great retention tool. I was going to tell you about that, uh, my, my, my thinking related to this, uh, the program that you have in your annual conference and using that as a retention tool. But let's go back to I what I told you that I, I what I'm going to tell your audience too, and those who are going to be there, I'm going to give six strategies that th- this is how you utilize the most cutting edge brain and behavior science and put it into practice immediately. And you're going to be able to do that in your work, whether you are an individual contributor or you're a leader. Whether you're an orthodontist, whether you're a technician, whether you're a front office staff, um, you know, it, 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 this is one. These are going to be six strategies everyone can use. And let me tell you, the first two strategies are going to be about how do we evolve and upgrade our thinking. So people are going to leave there being smarter and more controlled of their thinking, how we think about things like change and the chaos and the disruption and the things that we can't control around us because there are uncontrollables, right? And, and so the first part of this keynote is really gonna be helping people implement some strategies to be a better thinker and therefore more adaptable and resilient in their everyday life. Awesome. Now, I'm gonna tell you this too, Glenn, this is one thing I love the most about this too. One of these strategies, I'm gonna challenge everybody to take this home and teach it if they have kids, to teach it to their kids. And if they do, it's going to be one of the best things they ever teach them. And I call this the three R method. It's a method that's used for thinking and being your best thinkers. It's being used by Navy SEALs. 
It's used in a, for in executive coaching. It's being used for Olympic athletes. It's used by sports psychologists. And I think it's one of the most powerful thing for taking control of our own thinking. So I'm going to share that. That'll be one of the, the two strategies that I share. Now, I told you six strategies, right? So there's the next two. We're going to be talking about how to implement performance language. Okay. So not only how to improve your own performance and attitude and motivation, but how do you help do that with people around you? How can you actually influence people around you, whether it's your family or it's your coworkers or employees and help them. And this is research based. We're going to be looking at some of the research of John Barr of uh, Allison Wood Brooks from Harvard. And it's all based in this stuff about certain language and, and how we utilize our language and even words that we use that I call these ultra high performance language or, or, or words that we can implement. There's literally uh, uh, dozens of surveys out about how we prime people to behave and to think uh, and and to be uh, in the way that we would like them to be and to be better through the way that we manage our language with them. And so there's going to be two strategies on that. And then the last two strategies is going to be around how our, our own success. How do you wake up every day to thrive and to succeed? And when I say succeed, I'm talking about succeed by your own definition. Because Glenn, your def definition of success may be a lot different than my definition of success, right? Mm -hmm. And so in this last thing, I'm going to give you two strategies about how you can wake up every day and you can move towards success and truly thrive in life. And I'll, I'll explain what thriving is. Uh, I, I won't uh, uh, use my time here to do that. But I think um, when we think about thriving, it's a more holistic perspective of how we think about being happy in our life. Because I think wow. happiness is not what people think it is. And I like to not even say happiness. I like to talk about thriving in life. And it's more than just a momentary feeling, but it's more of a long term um way that we think about how we manage our life. So those are the, those are the six strategies. And uh, I think, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I know your, your audience is going to walk away with things to implement immediately. I'm excited about it. I, and again, there's so much conjecture in, on Facebook and Instagram. There's so many people say, I think, or I believe we're talking about a fo folks here about a guy who's got a PhD in exactly this field. You're going to find out the exact science behind most of this and why it works. And when you don't have science, he's going to tell you his thoughts on it. And uh, as we wind this up, because uh, we're almost out of time, I want to ask you one last question. Um, and I know you could probably answer this over a period of an entire day's lecture, but you know, more of a concise answer here. What percentage of the people that we run into who work with us, who we've hired and work with us, are just completely resistant to what we want to offer them, right? I read the book. I went to the lecture, I implement everything exactly the way Jason Jones tells me to implement it. And yet, you know, there's recalcitrant, uh, there's a word for you. There, there are those who are recalcitrant in, their, in the way that they behave. You know, they behave well for a little bit. And because of their home situation, because of their upbringing, perhaps, you know, the psychology of, of how they got to that point in life, no amount of help we can offer them is going to help them. They're going to do their thing no matter what we do. Is that a common thing? Or because I want to tell you right now, that's what most of us in this field have faced. Most of us have faced, um, and again, this is not a judgment. They're great people. Uh, I love my team members. Um, I, I would, they call me at 2 a.m. and need help. I'm bringing duct tape, a shovel, and a bag, right? right? I'm, I'm helping them with whatever they need. So it's not a judgment. It's just a statement that many of the people who work with us come from lives that are very different than the ones that I lead, right? Not necessarily the most stable homes, many times numerous fathers to, you know, young children in their lives, you know, the 25 years old with three kids from three different dads, none of whom are involved in life, you know, lives that they're hanging on by their fingernails to just survive getting to work and coming home from work. And in many cases, as my peers would tell you, they're not even doing that well, right? They're not showing up for work a lot. They're, they're, are these people also candidate? Is, is the brain just a brain? And if we treat it a certain way, even the person who's so different is going to respond in a positive way. 
There is no real uh, research in terms of percentage that I've seen out there. However, I've often said in training programs and, and speaking and consulting with people, coaching, that I believe just from what I've seen and what I've studied and talked to others, I believe about 5% of uh, human beings are what I call, you know, the foot draggers in this world. Right. And, and that is either they are, they don't care and nothing you do is going to make them care. Or, and we're, we're going to put people in the, in the functional category, about 5% of functional people. Okay. Because that, that, that 5% is not yeah. including people who have developmental disabilities and, and some things like that. Right. Um, and, and so I think there's about 5%. Now here's what I, I tell uh, practice leaders. I tell leaders in any big corporations one of your jobs is to make sure you don't hire those people in because getting them, they wreak havoc. They, they tape up your time. They take way too much time. And then getting them out uh, is very difficult of, of your, your organization and they're expensive, right? So what you want to do is you want to be sure you've got good hiring practices not to bring them in. But now when you look from there, and I like to kind of break it down into kind of like A players, B players, and C players after that. And, um, and, and, you know, your C players, you have a lot of C players that if, if we are a, a type A um, fast paced leader, practice leader, uh, especially if, you know, you're a doctor, you're orthodontist, um, it, even if you're, if, if you're a practice leader, a, pra a practice manager, um, you're at a much different level because you're there, you're, you've been an A your entire life and we can't lead from our own perspective, you mentioned the love languages. One of the things I like about the love languages is it gives you an understanding that I, I can love someone often very easily the way I like to be loved. But where it right. begins challenging is that to love someone in a way that maybe is lower on my priority list of my love language, right? Yeah. And it's the same way with leadership. And so too many of our A leaders are leading from a perspective of A leaders and B, B plus leaders. And it's evident in how they lead. They give their time. They want to spend time with them. They give them the attention. They give them the investment. And then the C leaders are out there. They don't know. So regarding your question, you are right. There are a lot of C's out there. And when you have C's in your, in your group, you've got, to, uh, you've got to lead from that level and think about how you can actually help bring them up to, to that, that B level. Because I think a lot of C's can get to B's. I think there's some C's that can't get to C, get, get to B's, but I think there are a lot that can. And, and, and the great thing is there are a lot of B's that can go to A and we, yeah. we can uh, bring out. Can you back. take a C to an A? That, that, that's right. And so really, I think all of what you're talking about here is back to the idea of great leadership. And that is doing the things that help bring out the best in your people so they can be and do their best. Right. And uh, I, I, you know, you're, you're going to hear in some of the things that I talk about that I believe that um, if you're an orthodontist, if you're a, a practice manager, um, if you're even a technician that's leading others, you're, you're going to see that there are going to be some things in here you'll do use from even a leadership standpoint to upgrade and evolve these people who may be at that middle level, may not be performing very well. And then also I'm going to give them if they're in the audience. We are going to light them on fire in a good way, Glenn, not in a bad way, in a good way. Now, we don't want to, we don't want to douse them with kerosene and, <laughs> they, and light them They're on. going to leave, I believe, with an extra sense of inspiration and motivation to give their best, to be their best and be and feel empowered to do that and know that they can do that. So we're going to help instill some, some passion and some confidence that they can, and I'm not going to, uh, maybe I, I will uh, give a little bit of a, a, a preview, but we, we're going to show them how fun it can be to wake up every morning and to choose to be their best, choose to thrive. And if we can help people That's do that, beautiful. man, I'll they're going to show up in every part of their life in a much better way. Yeah. Nobody likes a fun sucker. Nobody likes an Eeyore in their practice. And, and one Eeyore knocks out 10 tiggers, unfortunately. And uh, I'm just, I'm really looking forward to it. And the best part is you said they're going to leave with, they're not leaving. That's the best part. They finish your lecture. They're on a boat. <laughs> they're going to run into you. They're going to run into me. They're going to run into all the other teams. And, you know, the best part about this, about the summit, and I'm just saying it out loud because I'm, 
nobody that I know of has ever taken over an entire cruise ship for one group. And so in ortho and my hope is, is that there's going to be a lot of fun because lectures only go to about noon, 1230. And then the rest of the day is on their own. And the second day is all in Cozumel. I'm hoping that the first day lectures, people hear them, they're around the boat, people having dinner together, people are sitting at the pool together, people having drinks together, people are doing all these great activities together. And hopefully there's some rebounding that the, the things that have been talked about on the stage are now bouncing off of people and you know, different groups, different assistants are going to run different assistants from other fa- practices. Doctors are going to be running to other doctors. And by the time people get off the boat, my hope is that it's been like one big chamber, an echo chamber, where what, what was on stage the best is just bouncing off. And then people get off that boat ready to go change their lives to the better. And uh, I know that one of the voices that's going to speak the loudest in their head is you. And I'm just thrilled to have you as a part of the ship and as part of the, the whole summit. And uh, I want to thank you for being here with me today, Jason, because um, you're not only a researcher, an author, a keynote speaker, a performance coach, you're also a great human being and a wonderful person. And um, I just can't wait to have you on the boats. Jason, before we go, um, I just have to ask people, if someone wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to reach you if they're interested in learning more about what you do, workshops, have you speak for them, or maybe just work with them as a performance coach? How can they best reach you? Yeah, probably the best way would be my website. Visit me at drjasonjones.com. And so that's drjasonjones.com. And it has all my contact information there. And I'd love to, to speak with anyone who would like to speak with me. Thank you so much for being here, Jason, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks for, for allowing me to be here and share. <laughs>